Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm very delighted to welcome you all to the fifth webinar of CBOS 2021 Global Network Conference on the present and future of investor state dispute settlement reform. My name is Lu Wang. I am a lecturer and member of the Herbert Smith Free Hughes China International Business and Economic Law Civil Center at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law and Justice, and I will be moderating the event today. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Um, our topic today is about investor state dispute settlement, also known as SDS, which has suffered a global backlash and attracted controversies for uh, more than a decade. Opinions diverge on the merits and the merits of the foreign investment protection regime, and in particular, the investor state arbitration. Nonetheless, the concerns over the SDS regime have promoted states to make efforts to adjust their investment treaties by drafting more precise substantive investment protection standards and to leave less room for inter, uh, interpretation of those standards in SDS cases. At the same time, a process of procedural innovations is taking place, including efforts to make investment arbitration more transparent and uh, um, the consideration of a multilateral investment court to replace the current system. Um, moreover, leading international institutions and other stakeholders have also made efforts to reform the SDS system to respond to various public criticisms. Um, in October 2016, the <clears throat> International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes launched a comprehensive amendment project, and the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law started the work on consideration of possible reforms of SDS in 2017. So after several years discussions and debates, we are keen to know where we are now in the status of reform options and where we can go in the future. So today we have uh, a dream team of four distinguished experts on international investment law and arbitration joining us from the United States, the European Union and uh, Australia to talk about the SDS reform from different perspectives. As a moderator of today's session, I will give a brief introduction to each panelist before they speak because they are all well known and leading experts in this field. Each speaker will present for about 15 minutes and that will be followed by a comment on today's presentations and topic. After that, I will open the floor to the Q&A where all participants will have the opportunity to ask questions to the panelists. So please feel free to post your question or comments in the chat box. And we're looking forward to the interesting and illuminating discussions on SDS reform. All right, let me now introduce our first distinguished speaker, Ms. McKinney. Ms. Kenya is Vice President of the World Bank and the Secretary General of the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, also known as the ICSID. She has been in this position since 2009, and prior to her appointment, Ms. Kenya worked as the Director General of the Trade Law Bureau of Canada, where she was responsible for the conduct of all international investment and treating litigations involving Canada. Um, she's not only an extraordinary leader of the world leading institution dedicated to international investment dispute settlement, but also a leading expert on international investment law and investment arbitration. She has published widely in this field, and she is also a role model of many young scholars and practitioners, including myself. Since 2018, MAC um, has led a project to comprehensively modernize exit procedure rules. So we are very fortunate to have her today 
and Meg will be talking about the present and future of SDS reform from the exit perspective. Without further ado, let me pass the floor to Meg. Thank you very much, Lou. Uh, good morning to all. I'm delighted to be here and join you today. I'm going to start by uh, taking a look at one of the key pillars of ISDS reform right now, which is the amendment of the ICSID rules. And I call that a key pillar because ICSID has administered more than 70% of all known investor state cases. So reform at ICSID will obviously have a fairly widespread impact First of all, just because it will be a new set of rules applying to cases, but also I think in many respects uh, as, as a leader or a first mover in terms of some of this reform. So this is reform that I think will have an impact across the field. If we can change slides, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the background uh, to the reform process at ICSID. Uh, we began this process in late 2016 when we advised member states that we thought it was time to take a look at the rules and consider uh, modernizing those. This had not been done since 2006 and those who've been around this field uh, for a while will remember that ICSID did a couple of amendments in 2006 that were considered quite groundbreaking at the time. Uh, in particular, increased transparency and as well having a manifest uh, lack of legal merit provision like a summary judgment provision and uh, these have also been role models for various other rules subsequently but we had not amended since 2006 so we thought it was time to try the process at this point we were committed to and have had i think the most transparent rule amendment process we have ever had and we developed a working method whereby at the beginning we scoped out in particular with states, but also with uh, investor groups, NGOs, council groups, arbitrators, and asked what are the areas that you think should be addressed in our amendment. And after that, we pulled together what was known as working paper number one, where we comprehensively went through the rules and in every place where we thought an amendment was appropriate, we proposed draft language and explained why we had proposed this draft language and why we had crafted it in this way. And this was followed by a week-long consultation with states, as well as numerous consultations and conferences with other interested parties. And that working process ended up being one that we followed over the next years to the point where we are right now, which is working paper number five. Um, I am glad to tell you that I hope that working paper number five is probably, hopefully, the last working paper and that we have reached the stage where we have really narrowed down the issues in dispute. And so most recently we received from states uh, and from outside observers their comments on the provisions, and there really are, to my belief, very few areas where final changes will need to be made. So I am hoping that uh, 2022 is the year in which we put this to a vote and that these are adopted and implemented at exit. So if I can take you back to the next slide, uh, the objectives of this whole process were several. One, of course, was simply to modernize based on experience. We'd had since 2006 some 15 years of experience and things do come up in practice that you might not have thought of or that you think you can do better or technology changes and you want to reflect that. So it was time to modernize. It was also time to address some of the procedural issues that have come up in what I call the reform discussion. And as you know, there's been a huge amount of, of scholarly and practice discussion about how we might make investor state more fit for purpose. And I should say that is a discussion as well as of what works well, because a lot of it does work well, but also ideas about how things could work better. So we wanted to incorporate those ideas. Throughout, we felt it was extremely important to maintain a procedural balance between investors and states. Obviously, if the rules seem to be uh, tilted in one direction or the other, people just won't use those rules. So maintaining that balance was absolutely critical. And then the fourth, I think, key objective was to provide more options for dispute settlement. Uh, we have had since the beginning arbitration and conciliation. 
but there's been very little use of the conciliation rules and most of the cases have been arbitration. So we wanted to go back and make the conciliation rules more of a, a dispute uh, resolution and ADR te technique. And we wanted to add other options, which we did, and I'll speak about those in a moment, but fact finding and mediation. So to give parties different ways to settle their dispute. Uh, if we could pass to the next slide, just to let you know a little bit about the process that we face. We essentially uh, have gone through all of the rules and when we uh, address this to our stakeholders, we'll essentially have four different packages and it is a an up down or yes no vote that's required on each of these packages. So it is not a process where people can vote yes to rule one and no to rule two. It comes as a package because it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It all fits together and works together. So the first package will be those rules under the exit convention, and those are institution rules, financial rules, arbitration and conciliation. And there we need two thirds of our membership and I should note that, uh, in fact, our membership is now 156 because Ecuador has just rejoined uh, the ICSID convention, but we have a two thirds requirement there. So 104 yes votes are required for the other sets of rules, the additional facility, the fact finding and the mediation. We basically require a majority, so uh, we are going to be going for those votes all at the same time, or that's certainly the plan at this point but they need, uh, because of the convention, a different percentage to pass. If we can go to the next slide, the main issues that we've been dealing with on the amendment are these five that I've identified. And as you can imagine, there have been a huge number of um, discussions and changes, but I think the probably the biggest discussions have been around these five topics. So I thought I'd put a, a little bit of a focus on them. Um, first of all, time and cost of arbitration, which is always an issue. Third, third party, uh, second, third party funding. Third, the security for cost provisions. Fourth, increased transparency of the process. And then fifth, looking at new mechanisms and in particular, standalone mediation rules. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. The uh, first thing I wanted to drill down on a little bit is how we approach time and cost. And as we looked at this, and it perhaps won't come as a surprise to you, there is unfortunately no one thing that you can easily say is the reason these cases take a certain amount of time. And uh, every time you sort of reduce the time, you end up taking away time from often what one party might feel is necessary for them to put their case forward and for due process. So it's a very careful balance that we had to make in terms of trying to find places where we could reduce the time of the process. So we decided to do this through multiple ways, hoping basically they would accumulate overall in a process. So we have a general duty on parties to be expeditious. In a number of places we have prescribed specific times and shorter times for certain steps. So for example, challenges used to have to be made what's called promptly in the rules. And now we've said challenges must be lodged within 21 days of the time you know the issue that you're challenging on. We've required arbitrators to commit to being available for the case in the declaration. And we've added in a capacity to do some case management inspired by domestic rules where case management has been quite successful. We've also put in some time limits for decisions, orders and awards. And for example, an award is expected to be rendered within eight months from the end of the hearing. And we will be tracking those on our web page. So we will be all as a community put to the test to meet this. Uh, we also had proposed early on completely electronic filing and thanks to the pandemic, we don't have to pass that rule because that's de facto what's happened since May or March of 2020. We now have completely electronic filing and it's seamless, so it does work. And then finally, we had an option for expedited arbitration. If we go to the next slide, uh, the expedited arbitration is an interesting technique. It's one that's been quite successful in commercial arbitration. And one of the difficult questions was, what should be the criteria or what would trigger an expedited arbitration in an investment case? 
And it's hard because the dollar amount in an investment case probably does not tell you a lot about the complexity of the case. So we had to figure out what is it that would allow you to opt into expedited arbitration. And after much discussion, I think there was a lot of consensus among states that they wanted this to be available by consent of the parties, both to opt in and if necessary to opt out. Uh, among the techniques that will help to expedite is that you are able to choose a sole arbitrator if you wish. And essentially there is no bifurcation of issues or other motions. You essentially, once you get into this expedited arbitration case, go all the way through to the merits. And by our calculations, if you follow the process the way it's set out, you would cut down the time by about 50%. So it has the capacity to be very effective and the test will be to what extent do parties feel comfortable expediting investment arbitrations? And that's an open question, but at least the tool will be there for them. If we go to the next slide, one of the other or next very controversial issues is the whole debate about third party funding. And we had states who had positions all the way from third party funding should be completely disallowed to the other end of the spectrum, which is third party funding is an essential tool for access to justice. So you can see those are uh, opposite positions and obviously hard to uh, compromise on those provisions. And so what we've done is not take a position on whether third party funding is allowed or not. It is allowed, but we have focused on disclosure and in particular disclosure of the name and address of the funder, the non-party who's providing funds. And that is in particular so that conflicts of interest can be avoided. And what we have made is a duty of disclosure from the moment you get your third party funding and it goes throughout the case. And it is essentially just to disclose the name and address of the non-party, but the tribunal can ask for further details if it seems relevant in the circumstances of the case. So that's how we address the third party funding. And I think that's quite consistent with those few treaties that we've seen recently that uh, require you to address third party funding. On the next slide, we have uh, addressed security for costs. And currently what we have is a situation where requests for security for costs are increasingly made, but they all come under the rubric of provisional measures and as a result, the test for provisional measures. So um, what we did was carve off security for costs and make a specific rule. And it's got a specific test, including looking at obviously the ability and willingness to comply with an adverse decision on costs. On the other side of the equation, what's the impact of a cost order on a party's ability to bring the case? and then looking at the conduct of the cases. And there was a debate among those who felt that third party funding in and of itself should be given, uh, should be uh, uh, where third party funding existed, you should automatically have security for costs. That position has not prevailed, but certainly parties may bring up evidence that there is third party funding when they make their case on the facts about whether security for costs should be ordered. We also, if you go to the next slide, have added some criteria for costs awards. Uh, many people felt that it was important for tribunals to, to give more reasoning about costs. And so while it still remains a discretion of the tribunal in an exit case, we have asked the tribunals to specifically address uh, and consider what's the impact of the outcome of the case, who won or lost, of the conduct of the parties during the case, the complexity of the issues and the reasonableness of the costs claimed. So the idea being this will help us to get more fulsome awards on costs. Um, in, on the next slide, we had a number of provisions that all deal with transparency. And I think it's fair to say that they continue the expansion of transparency in the rules and in particular with a focus on getting decisions and orders and awards published and into the public domain. Uh, that has been started since the 2006 amendments. These rules, I think, will encourage that to an even greater extent. Uh, we also provided a definition 
of confidential or protected information so that when you are severing that kind of information from an award, it will be easier to know what de facto will not be made public and what will be made public. The next point I wanted to make on the next slide is that the additional facility rules of ICSID have been made much broader. Uh, currently, our additional facility rules are available where one of the two parties is from an ICSID contracting state. The new additional facility proposed will mean that an additional facility, an ICSID case, can take place between two non-members or parties from non-member states. So that is a, a significant extension of the scope. The other important extension of the scope of the additional facility is that it will be available for regional economic integration organizations. And probably the, the case you would think of immediately is, for example, the European Union, which is signing treaties in the name of the European Union. This would allow the EU either to be claimant or respondent under this set of rules. So it was important to add that um, to the amendments. The final set of changes I wanted to look at or to just review for you was uh, the idea of having more options for dispute settlement. If we can go to the next slide, we uh, put out several options and in particular, a new standalone set of mediation rules. And these complement the treaties that we are seeing now being signed, which encourage and in some cases have mandatory mediation uh, of the case. And we have uh, intentionally made these mediation rules broadly available, uh, essentially to any parties uh, where there is a dispute relating to investment. So it is a, a much broader window into the mediation process. And essentially the, the thesis here is if two parties want to mediate, we want to make sure that these mediation rules and our facility is available to encourage that. So we have this set of mediation rules. We have revised our fact finding rules. They have not ever been used. And I think it's a technique that's so specific. It may not often be used, but we felt it was worth keeping it for those cases where it was used. And I should add as well that we have revised the conciliation rules so that they are much more ADR flexible type of rules that you would expect given what we know about modern alternate dispute resolution. And finally, of course, we will continue to offer administration of UNCITRAL and other investment cases. So that's a quick look at the basic direction of the amendments. As I say, I am very hopeful that we will that we are rounding the bend and coming to a place where we will be putting this to a vote to the member states. Hopefully we will get the uh, the adoption and then probably with a sort of two to four month transition period, we will be applying the ICSID uh, amendments or I guess it'll be the ICSID rules 2022. So we are looking forward to that and uh, I will close for now, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the conference on this uh, on this amendment process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mac, for your very informative presentation on the exit rules amendment. And congratulations on the publication of the recent working paper, which is absolutely a remarkable achievement of the challenging process on SDS reform. Um, and you actually raised uh, many interesting issues and hopefully we can discuss that further in the Q&A session. So our next distinguished speaker is Professor Kira Drogetti. Professor Kira Drogetti is a professor of law at the University of Richmond. She is a leading expert in the area of uh, public international law, international arbitration, international courts and tribunals. Um, she teaches and writes extensively on these topics and has published very widely with world leading law journals and publishers. 
And Professor Giorgetti has undertaken a number of senior roles, including Vice President of the American Branch of the International Law Association, Chair of the Academic Council of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, and she is also a member of the Academic Forum on SDS and a member of the Executive Council and Executive Committee of the American Society of International Law. And previously, she practiced international arbitration in many places around the world and worked extensively with the UN on several major projects. Um, the topic of Professor Drogati's presentation today is a draft code of conduct for adjudicators in investor state dispute settlement, an important step forward in the reform process. Um, Professor Giorgetti, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you very much for having me um, today. Thank you for Cyber for organizing um, this event and uh, for um, um, the invitation, the kind of invitation by uh, Kung Fang and uh, Lu Wang. Um, today, as you said, I'm going to present um, the code, the draft code of conduct for adjudicators in uh, international investment arbitration. And I will introduce the code first and its main features and provide some um, some commentaries uh, of the code. Could you have the first slide, please. Thank you very much. Now, as a way of an introduction, the code is part of an effort of ancestral working group three. Uh, part of the reform process uh, that uh, that uh, the Working Group 3 is undertaking, uh, which address, as we've seen, both systemic and incremental changes, including how adjudicators are selected and appointed. Algeria first introduced the idea of drafting a code of conduct of, uh, of uh, ethics for, uh, for adjudicators in 2015. And I think there were two main um, issues uh, behind uh, this, uh, this proposal and this idea that actually a code of ethics was, um, uh, was required. One is that uh, ISDS is a very complex uh, system with many different actors coming from many different um, judic uh, legal systems where and there was no accepted common ethical standards. They were valid for everybody. At the same time, we had also a much more of a proliferation of conduct conducts of code of conducts uh, in many international forums, both in, in international tribunals and courts, but also in many arbitration centers. Um, so this idea was actually picked up by the Ancestral Working Group 3 and quite uniquely, the two secretariats, both the secretaries of Exit and Ancestral, were requested to draft a code of conduct to then be discussed uh, by the delegates at Working Group 3. Next slide, please. The Ancestral group, Working Group 3 gave some general guidance to the secretariats on kind of the content and the scope uh, of the code to include, for example, issues of independence and impartiality, uh, integrity, diligence, uh, the required, the requested, the, 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 the secretary of the code also to have wide applicability. It addressed also some specific issues, including double heading, issue conflict, and uh, repeat appointments. Um, the secretaries published the first draft in May 2020, and the second draft was published in April 2021. Uh, both drafts were open for discussions and comments, and these comments uh, were quite wide and there was a very big effort of dissemination of the content uh, of the draft and I think uh, the second draft built on those comments. The first reading of the code is now scheduled for November 2021 uh, in Vienna uh, online with actually a possible adoption of the code in 2022 um, and really the draft code addresses most of the cogent ethics issues that, that were identified by work, uh, working group three delegates and more generally by ISDS critics. The draft uh, that we are going to now kind of go through uh, still has some square brackets and choices of text to be discussed by the delegates then in, um, in November and possibly further. But the next slide, please. There are 11 articles in the present code. Uh, the first draft had 12 and very um, uh, um, helpful commentaries 
uh, to the draft. So the reason for the change to go from the first draft to the second draft and more commentaries are, uh, are to come, which I think will be very, very helpful in the implementation phase uh, of the code itself. Um, um, I should um, I should say at this point that actually I had the, the privilege to to work on the first draft of the code as a scholar in residence um, at at ICSID, um, and saw really firsthand how much effort uh, the, uh, the the secretaries put in this code and had the uh, really the privilege to contribute. These commentaries that then will come will appear in the final draft. Will be very helpful in the implementation and kind to assess assess where the um, where the provisions are and kind of the definitions, each definitions. The code itself can be divided essentially in three parts. We have an introductory part first. The second part has um, a, the specific obligations. And then the last uh, two articles uh, talk about implementation and enforcement. The draft code includes um, the kind of the general duties uh, that we would expect in an ethic in an ethics code, the general the, the general ethics code that we would find also in other uh, in the international uh, international um, domain. So it includes the duties of diligence, integrity, fairness, competence, civility, confidentiality, and also regulates uh, fees and aspect uh, and um, expenses. Um, could I have the the next slide, please? Um, so if you're thinking of so going first to the definitions, I think there are two issues that are important. This is actually the text of the second draft. And the two issues that I think they are, are quite important. One is the scope of the code. Um, the, it is very clear that the code applies to all adjudicators. Um, the code is the code of conduct for adjudicators in international investment disputes, and the adjudicator may includes both arbitrator and judges. And I think this is very important because, as we know, the reform process might include the creation of an appellate body or a permanent court, and we want to make sure that the code will apply to all uh, to all those people that have an adjudicative function from the moment that they are a candidate. Uh, and then they are, uh, uh, or the, and then they are appointed, and also include certain provisions that apply to assistant, uh, assistance to um, um, to the to the adjudicator. And the other, the second issue that I also would like to point out in Article One is the issue of what, how you define international investment disputes. So the code applies to international investment disputes, and international investment disputes are defined in this version of the code as a dispute arising pursuant to the investment provision and protection provision in, in the international treaty. The prior draft included both uh, law, domestic law and contracts. And I wonder if uh, seeing what the comments um, have been so far on the draft code, maybe there'll be a restatement, a re-inclusion of, of, uh, of contracts and law in, in a definition of um, IID. Um, and also provide a definition of judge. Um, can I have the next uh, slide, please? The Article 3 uh, is the very one of the very key provision of the code and addresses in, in independence and impartiality. Uh, and it could be very broadly divided into two parts. It has a first general part that defines what independence and impartiality means. Adjudicators shall be independent and impartial and shall take reasonable steps to avoid bias, conflict of interest, impropriety or appearance of bias. The first draft also included this idea of direct uh, or indirect uh, conflict of interest, but it was found to be a little confusing and so it was taken away. Of course, this uh, this is a, the exact definition will be will have to be agreed upon uh, by uh, by the delegates, but for sure the issue of independence and impartiality will be addressed is really one of the key issues here. The second part has more of a specific, provides specific examples. The, it is not an exhaustive list, it only provides example of what we define as uh, requiring as as uh, as parts of independence and impartiality. So, for example, here um, the adjudicator should not be influenced by self-interest, fear of criticism, outside pressure, political consideration, or should not take uh, instructions and use their position to advance personal or private interest, or not being influenced by loyalty to a treaty party or one of the disputing parties. Um, I think this is very much in line with uh, other existing codes, specifically in uh, investment arbitration, also the CETA, the state to state CETA part, or the CPTPP. Uh, next slide, please. Um, thank you. 
um, in terms of, of how the codes in general, uh, it provides uh, uh, one of the main feature really of the code is that it provides and requires enhanced disclosure as one of the main regulatory tool for enforcement and for implementation um, of the code. So there is a requirement that adjudicators provide an extensive and continuous disclosure obligation. Uh, and this is really very much of an essential policy tools uh, for implementation. Disclosure obligations exist at all times from the very beginning and continues, is the continuous duties. Uh, and in fact, adjudicators have to err in favor of disclosure if they have, uh, if, if, they, if, they, if they are unsure. Um, and adjudicators must disclose direct and indirect conflict of interest and any interest relations or matter they may, and I think this is very important, in the eyes of the parties, give rise to doubt. So the adjudicators have to think about in the eyes of the parties whether a conflict, uh, whether a disclosure is required or not. And they have to make a, a, a best reasonable effort to become aware uh, of such interest. Um, next slide, please. The second part of Article 10 provides the specific, more specific disclosure obligations. And again, this is just, and this is a non-existent list, this is an examples, and I think there are three important issues here to consider in terms of disclosure. One is kind of the degree of personal connection. And you will see here on um, A2, uh, for example, so one and two, uh, what kind of uh, personal relationship should be disclosed? with the parties, with the subsidiaries, with the legal representatives, um, the third party's funder and others. So first issue to think about is the degree of personal relations. The second is the time frame, And here you can see in the draft, a, uh, a bracket text that I said before was one of the ways in which it can be where, the, uh, where there's, this, there's going to be some discussions in, in November on the uh, final text. Um, and here we have the past five years, or in the second part, uh, past five to ten years. So it, the, an adjudicator is not, is not required to disclose anything in his, in his or her past or that happened maybe in law school, uh, but there is a, um, a, time, a time frame. And then, of course, the kind of case, which I think is quite interesting also. Does it, uh, is an adjudicator required to make disclosure obligations in relation to all um, investment um, investment disputes or international investment disputes or other kinds of proceedings too. And there have been many different um, kinds of take here, especially because some of the arbitrators may play, may be adjudic adjudicators may, uh, may be, um, may adjudicate also in other, uh, in other forum. Uh, what about uh, maybe public international law cases, international arbitrations of, of interstate or, or in other treaties uh, or, um, um, or in, in commercial cases. So here there's going to be quite, I think, some discussions about uh, about the, the kind of cases um, that require um, that require disclosure. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, and then finally, I would like to think about the three salient issues that the um, working group three actually re requested also the secretaries to think about. Um, and one is a double heading, which means what are the uh, which I think is quite unique to international arbitration. Um, what, uh, when, one, when one adjudicator is not only act as an adjudicator, but might also act as a, um, um, a counsel or as an expert. And here, Article 4 regulates a limit of multiple roles. Um, and again, here the issues to think about, to consider is what kind of roles, again, timing, uh, and what kind of cases. Uh, Article 4 says that unless the disputing parties agree otherwise, an adjudicator in an in a IID proceeding shall not concurrently serve as counsel or expert uh, witness or in another case. Uh, and then bracket test involving possibly what kind of cases, same factual background or at least one of the same parties. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion on this on this topic here. Also, uh, and Article 4 has been um, um, reframed in, in the second draft uh, and provides, I think, some quite specific um, uh, language that I find quite helpful. The second is issue conflict. Um, the issue conflict was actually re uh, uh, seen as a specific disclosure obligation in the previous draft, um, requiring disclosure of publications and, um, and public speeches. 
uh, this specific requirement is not there, but issue conflict is still seen very much as, as a disclosure obligation. And the third salient issue, repeat appointments. There's no specific provision in the draft code, but it's seen also as part of disclosure, which I think is quite interesting because given the present regulatory framework, disclosure really remains um, the most effective enforcement mechanism uh, uh, for uh, to provide uh, both a, a, uh, an effective um, ethics and an effective system, but also uh, to regulate uh, possibly ethics violation. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. The last issue that I would like to very briefly um, address is the issue of enforcement and implementation. Um, here it is, it, it is first and foremost for adjudicators. Adjudicators have an obligation to comply with the code. And secondary, the uh, disqualification or removal procedures remain uh, valid and, and apply um, as, um, um, as per any arbitral uh, institutions. However, they do not apply the, the um, implementation provision, Article 10 does not apply to, uh, does not apply to uh, 11, sorry, does not apply to disclosure obligations specifically. Um, the, it is very difficult to find uh, a, a, a way of enforcement. So now we have this kind of two ways, uh, the fact that the adjudicator has the first obligation to comply, um, and then it has it is for the, the disqualification procedures uh, kind of kick in. But I think there is there are more creative way to, to go about it. And I think we can be more creative in terms of finding um, enforcement procedures, for example, by thinking about monetary or reputational enforcement, or maybe by developing specifically institutions to provide enforcement and information kind of a central administrative system to think about implementation and uh, enforcement of the uh, of the code. Uh, finally, in terms of implementation, uh, are we going through each specific institution or possibly uh, drafting a new treaty or by agreement of the parties? Um, can I go for the for my last uh, slide, please? Uh, some conclusions. I think what it is important is that we have a um, implementation enforcement are really key, and I think it's very important that there is a system, the general system is adopted by which the code is implemented widely and enforced in a very similar way throughout the different um, the different platforms in, in investment institutions. It seems to me that the code addresses basic ethnic, ethical standards and is very responsive to a state's expressed uh, preferences. It's still in the draft, but I think it's very likely to be approved. And if, and if so, it will be a major reform uh, success in ISDS uh, and in Ancestral Working Group 3. Thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Kira, for your uh, very informative presentation and insights on the code of conduct. Um, this was a very a significant uh, development in SDS reform and the draft uh, and it was prepared jointly by both ICSID and CITRAL. So maybe we can come back to this uh, document later in the Q&A where we can hear more insights from you and also from Mac. Um, and uh, uh, if I remember correctly, one of your publication is um, about this, uh, the, the, the draft code of conduct, and it's published in the Journal of International Dispute Settlement. Um, I strongly suggest our audience reading this important research if you haven't done so. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Maria Laura Masaidu. Dr. Masaidu joined the University of Edinburgh Law School as a teaching fellow in international economic law in August 2019. She is currently a Max Weber fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. She has interdisciplinary background of international relations and legal expertise. Um, previously, Dr. Masaidu worked as a visiting fellow at the Department of International Law and Dispute Resolution of the Max Planck Institute Luxembourg and visiting lecturer in international investment law at King's College London. She has uh, also served as the chair of the um, Society of International Economic Law and has regularly collaborated as research fellow on various projects with the Italian Association for Arbitration. 
Dr. Masadu's presentation is titled, What is wrong with investment arbitration? Evidence from a set of behavioral experiments. Um, for some internet connection issues, we had to pre-record her presentation, but Dr. Masadu will be able to join us in the Q&A session. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague to play the recording. Good morning, everyone. Very early morning for, for me today. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be in such a distinguished company, even if just uh, virtually. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all the people at the Civil Center and when in particular for uh, all her help. And then I'd like to thank also uh, our chair, Professor Lu Wang, and our commentator, uh, Professor Kun uh, Fan. Now, uh, as the title of our presentation suggests, and I say our because this is a, a cultured paper and the, uh, was um, a research I have the pleasure to work on with my wonderful friend and colleague, Professor Pietro uh, Ortolani. So as the title of our presentation suggests, the intention uh, is to uh, understand why people dislike investment arbitration, what are the elements, the, the features that uh, the public perceive uh, to be particularly uh, problematic or that are particularly difficult to uh, accept. And specifically, the point we try to make in, in our research is that if we do not understand why social actors dislike investment arbitration, and when we say social actors, uh, we are thinking of NGOs, policymakers, academics, journalists, uh, citizens, and so on. And if we do not understand what is that this anti-ISDS front dislike uh, in its as uh, ISDS as we have known it, then we cannot understand uh, what type of reform is more appropriate and what type of reform is needed and should be carried out in order to be successful and widely uh, accepted. And this seems to be of paramount importance in a moment, uh, in this historical moment, uh, considering, for example, the process of reform that has recently been uh, initiated by uh, UNCITRAL. Next slide, please. So um, today, my uh, idea is to uh, discuss with you what are the different options, uh, what are the different reasons underpinning people's dislikement uh, against investment uh, arbitration, and then to uh, share with you what Pietro and I did in our research in order to understand uh, what is the main problem or what are the main problems uh, as perceived by uh, the public opinion. Uh, what did uh, we do in order to, to answer this, uh, this question and what are the results that we, um, we generated in, in, in our research? And then, of course, I very much look forward to, uh, to the Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, all, uh, we are uh, aware that over the last 20 years, investment arbitration has attracted criticism uh, from multiple fronts. Uh, probably the discussion around the suitability of investment arbitration uh, started around the, uh, the beginning of the 2000s and has materialized in different forms uh, ever since. Uh, to start with, we noticed that non-governmental organizations found particularly disturbing that non-elected uh, corporations were given the possibility to bring a claim against the government that was uh, hosting their, their investment and that they were given the possibility to um, be heard in front of an international tribunal. And uh, according to our research, what uh, NGOs find particularly disturbing is that these, thanks to investment arbitration, multinational corporations were given the opportunity to operate outside the boundaries of, of domestic law and especially outside the boundaries of constitutional law and sometimes also outside human rights uh, legislations. 
Then we have uh, academics, intellectual, uh, like, for example, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, who uh, have argued that um, investment arbitration may generate a chilling effect on the government, uh, on the regulatory uh, capacity of the government hosting the, the investment. And as such, there is a serious uh, threat and there is a serious danger that investment arbitration undermines the sovereignty uh, of nations. Uh, thanks to uh, highly public publicized cases like, for example, Vattenfall versus Germany or Philip Morris versus Uruguay, even the wider public has been exposed to, to the perils, if you want, of uh, the obscure ISDS uh, clause. Because these cases have plainly demonstrated also to the public that investment arbitration could actually hinder domestic policy goals. And also what we think it's uh, another disturbing element perceived by, by citizens uh, at large, by society at large, is that investment arbitration offers a special channel uh, for foreign investors outside domestic courts and the same possibility is precluded to domestic investors. And then we have uh, policymakers. I didn't change the last picture because in the end, uh, the, Biden, the position of the Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis investment arbitration has not dramatically changed. But this is to say that we have policymakers that have often criticized uh, investment arbitration. Uh, the problem with them is that they haven't really articulated a clear position. They haven't really um, articulate their, um, why they dislike investment arbitration, but they simply uh, insisted on the fact that the system is in need of a change and that uh, a restyling is, is indeed needed, or we have, uh, we even had some politicians that have pushed things a little bit farther, saying that ISDS is a feature that is not worth keeping in investment agreements uh, anymore. So this brief overview, is congenial to reinforce the idea that there is indeed something wrong or something that is perceived to be wrong uh, by many and by different stakeholders, by let's say an heterogeneously composed group of stakeholders that present uh, itself with different identities, often with different incompatible political profiles, with different uh, cultural and professional background. So as a consequence, we uh, we know that there is something wrong or that something is perceived to be wrong. And we also know that perception uh, matters in, in this case, uh, but we do not know clearly, it's not altogether clear where the main problem is, what is the most disturbing feature uh, for the public uh, at large that is currently uh, affecting uh, investment uh, arbitration. Next slide, please. So in order to understand uh, what is or what are the main problems uh, currently uh, affecting public um, uh, opinion, uh, regarding investment arbitration, Pietro and I decided to take a sort of original approach to uh, to answer this question. Well, at least we hope uh, we put together something uh, something uh, original. So we decided to uh, put together a set of experiments uh, to explore four possible uh, factors. So. Uh, we started our, our research by uh, outlining four possible explanations uh, to, um, to explain public opposition against investment arbitration, and we decided to, um, to test these four uh, hypotheses. Of course, these uh, factors are not mutually uh, exclusive, but we can have one or two or three uh, factors that are all concurring to, ex to provide an explanation for, for this problem. Now, uh, what we did was uh, presenting this experiment in a questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire was administered online and available in five languages, English, French, German, Spanish and, and Italian. 
And each questioner opened with a welcoming messages and was follow up uh, was followed by five prompts. We asked participants to um, to let us know their geographical location, their age, their political uh, affiliation, and their uh, occupation. And in each experiment, we presented uh, a story and uh, that was loosely based on a real investment case, even though participants didn't know that. And for each experiment, participants were divided randomly into uh, two groups, group A and group B. And each group was presented with a slightly different version of the story. Specifically, the two versions were identical in all but one uh, aspect. Having read the story, we asked participants to rate the outcome of that story uh, with a score from 0 to 10 where zero indicated that they were in complete disagreement or completely dissatisfied by that result, and 10 was an indication that they were in complete agreement and in com were completely satisfied by that uh, result. By measuring whether participant reaction in the two groups different, it is possible, therefore, to evaluate whether the factor in question, so the, the element that is changing from version A to version B, as indeed could be in, indeed be seen as an indication that this is a factor that the public uh, found particularly disturbing uh, to accept uh, when it comes to investment arbitration. Now, the first uh, um, hypothesis that we wanted to test is to understand whether the problem was in the fact that investment arbitration is problematic because it's international uh, adjudication. Uh, interestingly, the uh, reaction of the two groups uh, were almost identical, and this indicate that there is no empirical support, um, that there's, there is no evidence to empirically support the claim that controversial decisions are accepted more favorably uh, if they are delivered by a domestic court rather than by an international uh, uh, body. The second hypothesis that we wanted to test is to understand whether the problem is because of the values that investment arbitrators are called to apply and defend. Uh, again, surprisingly, uh, the, um, the result we obtain do not indicate that the substance of values that investment arbitration defends, regardless um, uh, how much controversial they, they can be, uh, it's not uh, in and of, uh, and of itself, it's not enough to explain the criticism that is level against investment arbitration. So the problem is not uh, because it's international, it's not because of the values uh, investment arbitrators are called to apply and defend. Another uh, hypothesis we wanted to test is, was to understand whether, for example, the fact that investment tribunals are not like a court-like standing body, um, adjudicator body, may be uh, problematic, may be perceived um, negatively by, uh, by the public. And this uh, experiment uh, generated particularly interesting results because all other things being, being equal, according to our findings, uh, a controversial outcome is perceived less negatively when it is issued by a standing court with tenor judges, rather than when it is delivered by an ad hoc tribunal with um, non-permanent uh, arbitrators. Even if uh, when the court uh, does not uh, enjoy any type of positive uh, reputational effect, because in the experiments we refer to the International Economic Court that is a court that doesn't uh, exist. So it seems that the, um, the, the direction uh, uh, the European Commission has taken, for example, in its investment court system and in the long term in the multilateral investment court uh, proposal as advanced within UNCITRAL, seems to be uh, addressing in part the um, public concern, uh, concern, the public concern vis-a-vis um, -vis investment arbitration. Lastly, the uh, fourth factors, factor that we wanted to, to test, the fourth hypothesis we want to, to, to test, was to understand whether uh, the public's 
uh, perceive uh, negatively the discrimination of investors on the basis of nationality. And we think this is the most important uh, experiment because there was a statistically significant difference between uh, the mean score of the two groups. Uh, this means that according to our uh, to the response we, we collected, uh, climate discrimination on the basis of a nationality has a very negative impact on participants' reactions, irrespective of their political affiliation, of their political uh, orientation, or their uh, professional or cultural backgrounds. The public doesn't um, like the fact that uh, a foreign investor is given the opportunity to uh, bring a claim before an international tribunal and the same opportunity is precluded to a domestic investor or if you want to put it another way that domestic courts are good enough for a domestic investor but not good enough for a foreign investors and we believe this is of paramount importance uh, this last experiment, because this is an element that has been completely dismissed and completely overlooked in the discussion uh, that has been carried out at least within uh, UNCITRAL. Um, so perhaps this is something uh, that uh, reformers should take uh, into, into consideration. Now, I think my time uh, is up now, so uh, I very much look forward to, to your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Maria for the excellent presentation. And I found it's quite interesting, especially that you and your co-author used an empirical approach to examine the public criticisms against investment arbitration. And I think that's a valuable empirical resource for the debates on SDS reform. And for our audience, if you'd like to know more about this research and analysis, please check out the publication in the European Journal of International Law. Now, I would like to invite my colleague, Associate Professor Quinn Fan, to share her views on today's topic and provide comments on the presentations. Associate Professor Fan is a member of Herbert Smith Free Hughes Ch um, China International Business Economic Law Center at the UNSW Law and Justice. Um, she is an award-winning scholar in the areas of international arbitration, mediation, and comparative legal studies. Um, Professor uh, Fan is also of the Arbitration in China, a legal and cultural analysis published by Hub Publishing and has published extensively on cutting edge issues in a variety of leading international journals. Um, she was uh, named Norton Rose Fulbright Faculty Scholar in International uh, Arbitration and Commercial Law in 2017 and has received numerous awards in recognition of her academic contribution. She has also extensive experience in ADR practice and has worked as counsel legal expert, um, secretary for the arbitration tribunal, arbitrator and dominant names published a panelist in a number of international arbitration and domain name disputes. So without further ado, um, I'll giving the floor to Quinn, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. And I wanted to first thank all of our three speakers for their excellent presentation. We're really honored to have them with us today. And I think their presentation really brings quite divergent aspect of the ISDS reform. So I will probably make my observation in the reverse order from the criticisms of the ISDS and then to the current reform efforts to address them. Um, so I think Maria's paper really presented a very interesting research to understand the rules of public criticism on investment arbitration through this set of behavior experiments. Um, public opinion is indeed largely overlooked in the course of ISDS reform, which were predominant focus on the states, but I think they're very important to support the legitimacy of investment arbitration system and also for policymakers to know which areas the reform should focus on. So in this aspect, I think Maria and Pietro's research really provide quite important insights. Um, I do have one question in terms of the, the selection of participants, whether there might be any potential bias, as I noticed about 
43% of the respondents were actually located in Europe. So I was wondering whether this low representation from participants in other regions, for instance, in particularly Asia, Africa and Central America might have any impact on the outcome of the empirical research. That said, I, I do think the research does a tremendous work and do have very important implications. It particularly is very encouraging to see the creation of an international mechanism to resolve investor state dispute does not in and of itself lead to the laws of public support. So the goals of ICS reform are therefore achievable. The question is what changes can be made? And the research then further tested both substantive and procedural criticisms of the system. It was quite interesting in the second experiment on the substance that you found even when investment arbitration protects the relatively uncontroversial rights, so in your scenario, the right to liberty and security, the respondents still tend to perceive it as less useful than if it was brought before the European Court of Human Rights, which I actually found unsurprising because of reputation of the European Court of Human Rights. And I think it does support the idea that even without significant change of substantive law, we can still improve public opinion by changing the institutional design, which is the focus of the ICS reform. But I wonder whether that necessarily suggests that changes in substantive law will not make a significant difference. So for example, I'd be interested in maybe for future research and experiments, a story based on a case brought before the same adjudicator body, let's say the fictional International Economic Court, but the substantive law changes presented to the two groups. So in group one, let's say the September law incorporate positive social, um, corporate social responsibility provisions on investor, whereas in group B, the September law presented, you know, no consequence for investors violation of human rights. Whether that make any difference in their responses, which I think might be interesting to further understand if an improvement in, in September investment law could elevate uh, public concern. Because even though the Ancestral Working Group 3 did focus only on the procedural aspect of ISDS, um, in the reform option it did mention counterclaims, which I think also raise important issue of substantive law. And there's also recent development in the treaties that reflects a redirection from a sole focus on the investor protection to a more balanced approach, respecting states' regulatory space and incorporating um, you know, business human rights provisions into the investment instruments. So I'd be interested to know if those developments and improvement in substantive law might make a difference in the public opinion. And I think the third experiment is indeed very interesting, which shows other things being equal, public seem to be less disturbed by a decision made by a standing court, which is very um, positive support to the reform efforts of multilateral investment court and the appellate body. Um, but we haven't fully addressed this in this panel, so I'd actually be interested to hear more perhaps from all speakers. What do you think, you know, this multilateral investment court and appellate body fit into the reform agenda? What are the opportunities and limitations of this? And the final finding was actually quite surprising and an important one, the inaccessibility of investment arbitration by domestic um, investors, which indeed was never addressed in the current debate. Um, so I, I guess I would be interested to hear more from Maria what type of reform you think can be enacted to, to elevate such public um, concern. And now moving on to the current reform efforts. Thank you so much, Meg, for the excellent update on the exit rules amendment project, which is a significant achievement and also address a number of concerns of the ISDS, including time, cost, increased transparency, third party funding, security for costs, etc. And I'm particularly interested in the new mechanism that you mentioned, including the standalone mediation rules, which I think is a quite important step. And it may be important to recall that the very creation of exit was actually based on World Bank's experience um, in you know, conciliating a number of high profile investment disputes. Right? So, and the conciliation was actually viewed as a focal point when exit was created, but quite to the surprise of the founder of EXIT that uh, state didn't seem to be so interested in conciliation, instead preferred arbitration. But I think the today though, mediation investor state dispute may have actually attracted more attention and get more widely acceptable, although more could still be done. And there are other institutional efforts, such as the IBA's rule on 
investor state mediation, the ECT's guideline investment mediation. But I think the exit mediation rule may potentially also have more impact. And the reform option in the Ancestral Working Group 3 did also mention dispute prevention and mitigation, including the use of mediation. And the entry into force of the Singapore Convention could also incre increase users' uh, trust towards mediation. Meg already mentioned that there is also a growing reference to mediation in the recent treaties, which I think could also strengthen the legitimacy of investor state mediation. And interestingly, uh, in the Hong Kong, UAE, BAT, and Indonesia and Australia, SIPA, um, it had a contained provision of mandatory conciliation as a precondition to arbitration. So perhaps, you know, mandatory mediation as a precondition could an be another option to be further explored. So I guess I'll be really interested to hear more from Meg about the potential impact of the exit new mediation rules as part of the ISDS reform and whether investor state mediation could be a partial response to some of the criticisms of ISDS. And finally, thank you, um, Kiara, for presenting such an important effort of Ancestral Working Group 3, in particular the Code of Conduct, which I know you're quite actively involved. And I, I agree that it is very important step forward, which addresses a number of sens sensitive issues. Uh, as you mentioned, the, the repeat appointment issue conflict double hatting. Um, and I also think that a common code of ethics could partially address some challenges of fragmentation, which each institution adopt their own set of rules and ethical standards. Um, but um, the success of the code will eventually depend on how it is enforced and implemented. So you already mentioned the different options for implementation, the multilateral treaty, institutional rule or party agreement. Um, and I think the challenge is how to ensure also consistent application um, of the code. So I was also wondering if the code, let's say if it's added as an annex for instance, to the exit arbitration rules or if it's additional facility or be incorporated in the arbitrator declaration. And if we are to adopt a complete prohibition on the double hatting, then that would mean exit cannot appoint arbitrator on their panelists who act both as counsel and arbitrator. And I think there are many of them. So that could greatly reduce the pool of potential appointees. So whether then exit will need to ask all the member states to reappoint the candidates when the code, if the code is to be incorporated or perhaps wait for the expiration of the mandate. Um, I also have a question about more specific implication of the multilateral court. I think you already mentioned the code is designed to apply to old adjudicators, which would also include judges in a standing mechanism. Uh, but the UK in its recommendation comments on the second draft, I think they recommended the working group to seek develop the code as it applies to the existing system of ISDS and reconsider its application of the standing mechanism once negotiation has progressed. So I'd be interested to hear more about your views about the application of the code in the context of multilateral investment court and also whether it applies to judges at all levels, including the pallet mechanism. And finally, you mentioned a few, um, you know, other additional potential sanctions um, like um, uh, I think remuneration disciplinary measures, which I think could probably be implemented by some institutional rules, such as reducing fees for arbitrators. And I was also wondering whether, for instance, some added transparency into the adjudicator conduct and track record might be helpful to encourage self-compliance, as suggested by Chile in their comments, and also whether there should be more of a centralized inform enforcement mechanism, or perhaps like an advisory body to ensure more compliance. Uh, so those are just some of my thoughts and questions. And thank you again for all the speakers. I look forward to hearing further insights and for the other discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun, um, for your very insightful comments and uh, quite interesting questions. And I think it's the perfect time for us to dig out uh, these issues and elaborate more about um, the problems we just mentioned. So, uh, so I will open the floor for the Q&A and uh, uh, I will take the opportunity to access my privilege as a moderator to take the questions and invite our panelists to address them. So perhaps we could start with Quinn's questions and Maria, Mag, and Kira on 
they 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 concerns and the the quite interesting um, issues mentioned by Quinn in her comments. So maybe we can start with Maria, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that you read the paper and that you read it thoroughly. So thank you very much for for that. Uh, just a couple of very brief uh, follow ups and the comments. Uh, the selection of participants. Yes, we acknowledge that uh, the results were predominantly Europeans from Europeans uh, because they were probably most uh, uh, easy to reach because, for example, when it comes, let's say, to members of uh, national parliaments, their uh, emails are freely available online, so it was easy for us to put together a database with, uh, for example, uh, members from different European member states, but also from countries like uh, Australia. Uh, when it comes to uh, East country and Asian countries, that is not always the option. So one uh, way of doing this, this experiment was to consider calling people. But we weren't sure that you know they were willing and available to um, to provide an answer to basically uh, Pietro and myself, so unknown research to, to them uh, via phone. So that's why we ended up having more uh, results from from Europe. It's uh, I would say a logistical pro problem because we sent uh, almost twenty thousand uh, invitations. And we just got uh, the, the majority of response were from Europeans, so they were probably, I don't know, more interested. Uh, they like the experiment. Uh, I think there are some maybe anthropological uh, questions here to, to explore, but that's to, to explain why we got more uh, European uh, responses. And the suggestion about testing corporate social responsibility and more broadly the investor's responsibility, yes, that crossed uh, our mind uh, as well. But in the end, we had to make choices because uh, we knew that we couldn't ask people to uh, read, uh, to be, um, we couldn't ask people to dedicate us more than 10, 15 minutes because otherwise it would have been a risk of not having any answer at all. So in the end, we made uh, some choices. And then to um, a comment when you say uh, about your question about multilateral investment court, how does it fit? Uh, I think one important element to consider is also to keep an eye on what has just happened uh, within the WTO system and the appellate body crisis. And this is to say that, in my opinion, there may be limits to the extent to which uh, a judicial body is perceived as a substitute for policy making. So as long as the judicial body is just delivering um, within its own mandate, I think it's acceptable. But whenever this judicial body is overstepping and in a way is uh, exceeding or uh, interfering with the policy making sphere, which is a very blurred line sometimes, uh, I think that may be particularly problematic, especially for states. And uh, I stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. And now I turn to Mac. Um, would you be able to elaborate a bit more about the mediation rules in the exit rules amendment context? And uh, for myself, and also I think questions from the audience as well. And um, we are very interested in your views on perhaps the impacts of the current reform initiatives. So we know there's you know various options available for the states and stakeholders. I just wonder if you have seen any problems with the virus options. And thank you very much. Terrific. Well, oh, Kun, you brought up many wonderful points. So, but just to talk a little bit about the mediation rules. Um, one of the things that I think is important to note about these is that these are designed to be used in multiple ways. And I think it 
means lawyers actually may want to really be creative so that they will use them. Um, the obvious way would be obviously before you start a case or at the beginning of a case in a cooling off period. Uh, that's where we often think about mediation, but we also designed them so that they could be used parallel with an arbitration or with another process. And you could, for example, take one point and have it under mediation and the rest uh, being done by your arbitration, or you could uh, uh, suspend your arbitration and go into mediation if you think at a certain point that's worthwhile. And that was one of the things we wanted to make sure was available because when you look at the time periods when people settle, there are about four distinct time periods as you go through an arbitration. And so it seemed to us there were opportunities to use mediation, not just as the very beginning of a case, but otherwise uh, during the case. And we wanted to make that available. Um, in terms of what kind of a mechanism it is, uh, I think it has a lot of the traditional hallmarks of mediation. Uh, essentially, you can choose a sole mediator or co-mediators if you want. There's a basic statement of the case and then you sit with the mediators and come up with a protocol. And then there's a lot of flexibility in terms of exactly what kind of a process. But among the things that uh, have been built into these rules is that you can uh, talk with one part or the our mediator can talk with one party separately from the other party. So sort of the caucusing kind of technique that can be very useful. Um, if the parties agree, the mediator can make a recommendation even where they're not able to resolve the dispute. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of flexibility to how this happens. And I think that's going to put a premium on developing really good mediators who have both the investor state understanding, but also the mediation technique. And that's something that's starting to happen. The other thing that I think is very important is the enforcement aspect of a mediated settlement. This was built uh, specifically to take advantage of the Singapore Convention. So a mediated resolution under the exit mediation rules could be enforced in accordance with the Singapore Convention. The other option, uh, which is an interesting one, is that if this takes place in the context of an arbitration, for example, parallel, you could actually memorialize your mediated settlement in an award and then take advantage of the exit uh, simplified enforcement mechanism. So I think this should be a good incentive to use. What impact it will have, it'll be very interesting. There is a lot of enthusiasm about it, and I guess uh, time will tell if parties are really willing to engage, but it seems to me that a uh, mediated resolution is so consistent with the purpose of ISDS that you uh, retain investment flows and encourage investment flows. So I'm hopeful that uh, with all of this training that's going on, to make governments and investors familiar with this possibility that it should be that it should be a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mac. Uh, I'm now passing the floor to Kira on, uh, Quinn, uh, to address Quinn's questions, and uh, it would also be helpful if you could talk a little bit more about the impacts of the code of contact as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, Kira. Many thanks. I cannot. Um, okay, good. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself, but I couldn't. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, these are very, very interesting questions. So I'm really glad, and, and you raised a lot of very interesting issues. Uh, now, what would be the impact uh, of the code? And I, I agree with you that um, implementation and enforcement will be the key. Now, uh, as Maria mentioned, one of the a criticism that were identified as real was the way in which who selects and who who were the judges, who were the adjudicator of uh, of investment disputes. And I think the code in that way addresses some of the concerns, some of the ethical concerns, uh, for example, on issues of um, um, of disclosure, on issue of uh, multiple multiple roles that somebody can play. Um, so I think that would be that has potentially a very important. Um, uh, is, is it, it, it can be a very important element to clarify um, the ethical requirements and kind of comfort some of the criticism. But I think at the same time, a lot will depend on how the code specifically will be uh, implemented. So I really think that it is very important that the code will be implemented uniformly. Uh, and so, for example, I think that we should not think about a code for judges 
for the possible multilateral investment court and another one for arbitrators. I think it would be very important that we do not um, create a lot of very different ethical standards, but we kind of agree, and this is why we have very important negotiation. And I think it will be very, it's actually very important to note that in working group three, we see a lot of participation from many stakeholders, many states uh, and increasingly states are participating, but also other stakeholders, civil society and learned societies and, and, and others. So I think the working group three effort of disseminating and discussing these issues, the issues of ethics uh, and, and the provisions of the code will be very, very important. And once these uh, provisions are, are agreed on, um, I think it would be very important that they are uniformly um, implemented and enforced so that uh, both judges and arbitrators, so every kind of every person that has an adjudicate function uh, are held by the same by the same standards. Uh, but also uh, we have the same standards that kind of evolve in the same way. So I think it would be very important to create an institution that is kind of mandated with enforcement and implementation of the code, especially with enforcement of the code. I think it would be very hard to ask one arbitral institution to implement for everybody, but I think consistency and, and uniformity will be key. Uh, and I think that different ways, so we can create some form of a kind of an ombudsman or an expert uh, that may collect information, for example, about disciplinary measures, Something will be easily, the data that are, it be easily collected. So for example, if um, adjudicators are late, right, that they don't respect time limits, that that would be easy. Other things would be much more difficult. Uh, but I think, again, we can be creative and try to find ways in which we can uh, have some uh, disciplinary measures. So trans transparency, I think I agree with you, it's, it's key. Um, rep so reputational sanctions and, and diffusions of information is also be important. Monitoring will be harder. Um, but I think a kind of a general, uh, a, a centralized system um, will be very important. Um, and I think the commentaries also to come will be very important also to exemplify and to show the kind of the content, uh, the content of the provision. Um, you also raised the issue of diversity. Um, and I think there are, I know that these people have, have concerned that possibly, you know, having a um, a cap on cases or uh, prohibiting um, counsel, serving of counsel and, and arbitrators at the same time might reduce the pipeline or reduce uh, the, uh, you know, uh, reduce diversity. I actually think that um, we have a lot of potential candidates and maybe we can think a little bit kind of outside the box and make sure that we uh, use the use those candidates. So I don't think the code itself or, so, or any of the provisions will be detrimental to um, to diversity and, and to making sure that uh, we have a sufficiently diverse um, uh, pool of uh, pool of, of adjudicators. Um, maybe Mag wants, wants to respond more specifically about the exit uh, the, the, the list, uh, but but I do think that. Um, in terms of enforcement, uh, we, we, in terms of diversity, these, these are kind of the keys. My last comment on implementation. Um, again, I think what we really want, the mean, the, the, the goal is to have this code to be applied as uniformly and as um, widely as possible. So I think it would be also very important to have uh, different uh, ways to implement the code itself, treaties or possibly uh, attach it to the declaration of arbitrators and others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kira, for your illuminating response. And just wonder, Mag, if you'd like to address a little bit more about the, the enforcement or the, the implementation of the, the, the code um, yeah. to follow on. There are some topic. very good issues that come up, and we have always said we're doing this joint effort. At a certain point, we will have to take whatever is agreed upon and then say, how do we put this into the exit context? And the panelist is one of the key questions, for example, you have panelists appointed by states for six year terms. If they happen to be double hatters would, and if double hatting is fully prohibited, would this mean they could not sit on a case? So we're going to have to figure some of those issues before putting it into the exit context. Uh, we also have to figure out consistency with articles 56 and 57 of the uh, exit convention. So there will be some adjusting. Um, 
And then also, how is this going to be implemented? That will make a huge, a huge difference on sort of how much adjusting you would need to do to put this into a Nixon context. So basically, we see this as let's get the basics agreed upon, but then we're going to have to have separate discussions with our members to figure out how to do this in the exit context. But first, let's get the basics. So that's where we're at now. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mac, Karia and uh, uh, Maria. And uh, I think I've taken into account of most questions raised by the participants, but I just want to ask perhaps one more general question to all participants, uh, all speakers. Um, I'm quite interested in, in your views on the uh, reform agenda and the directions it's taken. And uh, I think it's also a question from uh, asked by uh, uh, our uh, participants as well in the chat box. So how do you see the issues discussed today, um, including the reforms of exit rules and the code of conduct relating to other uh, wider aspect of ISDS reform direction, uh, di discussions? Um, do you see these reforms as largely address um, concerns about ISDS or are the step um, down to more fundamental rethinking of ISDS? Um, Matt, can I start with you on this? Sure. Um, so my sense, of particularly the exit rules, were obviously meant to only be procedural. They are a set of procedural rules, so that's not surprising. Uh, but I think the exit rules and then some of the issues being brought up at UNCITRAL will respond to a lot of the concerns we have heard about, and they will make a big difference. Where I think you should look to for what you might call substantive rethinking is something that is probably ongoing in terms of uh, the number of model treaties. That's where we're seeing it. And then some of the newer treaties. So uh, these are uh, by definition procedural. And I guess in the sense of discussions about a, a multilateral court or an appellate body architectural. But my understanding of working group three was that it was not intended to go to substantive obligations. And that kind of reform I think we will see more on a state by state basis, as I say, with model treaties or or newly signed treaties. Thank you. And Kara, what do you think? What's your views? Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm having troubles again. Uh, try to um, unmute myself. OK, so I hope I hope you can hear me um, I agree with, uh, yes, with Mag. I think. Thank you. I think um, so the, there, are, there are several issues. I think um, the reform pro uh, uh, process, I think, is is very interesting and is addressing a lot of interesting issues. As I said before, I think it's quite interesting to see how many people are involved and more and more stakeholders and delegates are involved in um, in discussing the, the reform. Um, there are the the process is mostly the reform agenda now it's very much a it very much addresses procedural issues there are some issues that are substantive so we're thinking about counterclaims for example um there are issues possibly addressing frivolous claims or you know others that may they may be seen as as substantive as substantive also uh, but it is mostly procedure and i think it's quite interesting to think also that this is kind of ex post we have all these treaties and now they're trying to to shape them and have have them kind of fit in the same in the same uh, in the same format um, which i think is quite interesting it's quite novel um, but i agree with me that most of the substantive issues will be addressed on treaties in the investment treaties whether they are multilateral or bilateral but this is where the substantive issues will be changed and in terms of the procedure it seems to me that some the reform agenda addresses some of the concerns um, that that were raised by civil society, not entire, not all of the concerns. I think it's quite interesting to see that we we can we can think about um, very uh, uh, reforms that are really large and would change the system quite substantially, like uh, the creation of a multilateral investment court, or will be much more specific, for example, like the code 
But I think it's also th interesting to think about uh, the time frame. I think it's quite extraordinary that if the code is approved, really discussed in November and then approved in 2020, it is quite successful, uh, it is very expeditious, but the reform is taking uh, quite long and uh, I, I don't know how long um, it, it's going to be several years until we see um, some more substantial, some more uh, uh, maybe larger results, and I think we have to think about the time frame um, also and what um, stakeholders need. Thank you, thank you very much, Kira and uh, uh, Maria and Quinn. Do you have uh, any comments on this question? I'll go. Yes, please. Yeah, I well, I am an optimistic by nature, so I, I think there is some positive, you know, in this or reform uh, efforts. I agree with Megan and Chiara. Uh, there probably uh, needs to be a combination of procedural efforts, but also some substantial uh, changes and. I think in the end, the last word uh, is probably again up to states because they need to uh, to decide first of all what the uh, what their investment agreements are for. Are there as a, as a way to ensure sustainable development, or are there just to attract foreign investment? Because depending on the answer, you may have one kind of reform or or another. And more broadly, I think the, the impact and the, the direction of, of this reform agenda is to understand on uh, for what uh, is this reform being uh, implemented and uh, what are the, the, the areas that are in need, uh, in most urgent need of, of being uh, addressed, uh, addressed. So I think probably a combination of both would be uh, the best uh, approach and also, uh, as I was saying, a clear uh, standing on uh, what are the expectations vis-a-vis -vis an investment treaty and therefore vis-a-vis uh, -vis investment arbitration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for your comments. And uh, I think uh, um, it's, it's um, and I mean, the ISDS reform is, is, is um, not an easy task and uh, there's a long way to go to address the virus concerns. So I hope we can have opportunities in the future to continue uh, to discussing this very important, well challenging uh, topic. Um, and I think it's perfect position for us to conclude this panel. Um, please join me thanking the distinguished panel for a fantastic discussion and I really learned a lot and I hope uh, you do as well. Uh, if you want to follow up with your questions with the uh, panelists, please do so. And thank you again, Mac, Kara, Maria and Quinn for joining us today. And thank you to our audience online for your participation and questions. I hope I have time to address all of your questions, but we have time limits, so I can only do uh, some of them. Thank you again, and we'll be in touch once the recording is available online. Um, last but not least, I want to take this opportunity to thank our civil colleagues, Feiyang and Wen, for their professional support to our panel. Um, before we go, there's one more upcoming event of the 2021 Civil Globe Network Conference on October 1st, and we are looking forward to seeing you again then. Um, all right, thank you everybody. Have a nice weekend.